In this episode, I am sitting down with George Nichols, the president and CEO of the American College of Financial Services. Now, this is a really special episode for me and moment for me because George Nichols was one of the first people I ever did a prep interview with when I was producing someone else's podcast a few years back. And so to have him as a guest on my show, my very own show, a few years later, it feels very full circle. And I, of course, tell George this insight uh, live on the podcast so you can get his real proper reaction to that special moment. But if you don't know what the American College of Financial Services is, George is here to break it all down. What does this have to do with fintech? You're about to find out. But think of the college as a place that really combines financial advice, financial services, technology, education, all into one place. But it truly is centering the educational factor of financial services, especially for professionals and advocating for those ethical standards that really benefit society and and um, encourage our industry to do good and and build great things and, and always remain educated for the long term because we're all students at the end of the day. So excited for you to tune into this conversation and to learn more about what George is working on over at the American College of Financial Services. Enjoy this episode. Well, just George, otherwise known as George <laughs> Nichols, yeah. the president and CEO of the American College of Financial Services. Welcome to Humans of Fintech. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm so excited to have you. So I have to tell you a story okay. before we jump in. And I've been waiting to press record to tell you this. So do you remember the podcast, Her Success Matters? Yes. Yes, from Investment News. Yes. So in 2020, I actually started working at Investment News as their fintech reporter. And through my passion for elevating women in financial services, I got involved as the content producer for Her Success Matters. So I actually... Uh, pre-interviewed you you probably you might not even remember. I don't remember yeah I was say you probably don't even remember and then I because it was I was so early um and then and I didn't know anyone and no one really knew who I was because I was just so new and um but I used to do all the prep interviews and all the prep documents okay for Christine Shaw the host yeah. at the time yes. and so this for me is like a very full cir circle circle moment because you were the first like podcast guests that I like prepped and set for I'm that. Honored. Yeah. And now you're on my show. Ooh, that's impressive. Yeah. I'm and honored. so like so much growth and so many things have happened. But I want to tell you so that when when are we going to be on an even bigger show? I know. I know. Call me. Please. That's Oprah. Yes. yes. Yes, we should be actually you can take Oprah's place. And yeah. <laughs> You Did you hear that, everyone? I'll be your first guest. <laughs> oh my gosh! Apparently, I'm taking Oprah's place. Oh, the Oprah of fintech, you could call me if you will. I like it. You like that? I okay. Like it. Well, I'm so I'm so excited to have you on the show and so and have this this moment together. Um, but before we jump into all things the American College of Financial Services, I always like to start these conversations with first learning a bit about the human behind okay. the the job and the function and the the title. Um, and I know that your story starts with one having a lot of um, strong female support around you um, and, and you grew up in Kentucky and all of these things. But feel free to fill the gaps for us, for my listeners that don't you know, know sure. your story and how you how does someone like you get involved in financial services? Uh, most of the uh, financial services stuff is purely by accident. I yeah. Just sort of fill in. Okay, let's just, uh, End I, of story there. I wish I could sit and tell you, like, well, let me tell you, I really had this plan. No, I no. did not. Uh, but clearly, from Kentucky, uh, I have four sisters, no brothers. I yeah. am the youngest in the family. And then getting married, I have a strong black wife. I have two girls, very, very strong. And so as a result, I've always grown up around these women and... Uh, they told me what I could and could not do related <laughs> to women. So let me just make sure that I'm a domesticated <laughs> animal. My wife will tell you that. Uh, but it, it showed me really an appreciation of their struggles. So imagine coming in Kentucky, you're, you're growing up, you're black mm -hmm. in a very racially segregated community. Mm -hmm. And then imagine being black and female. And it's even more challenging. And so their struggles coming up through that environment and having relationships with men that were not that great. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I learned a lot 
uh, both in what I saw, but what they taught me mm -hmm. to actually think about it. So when I think about my professional career, <clears throat> one of the most interesting things is um, the majority of the jobs that I've had, mm -hmm. a female succeeded me. Yeah. And it was, I've always been comfortable that a lot of my leadership team is female mm. uh, because I know I got to work twice as hard. They're probably working three times as hard. She has to have it even. So that's sort of been my philosophy. Yeah. But getting into financial services, I convinced myself when I was young that the reason they were treating me the way they were was because I was poor, mm. not because I was black, because I couldn't change my color. Right. Uh, and so I said, I got to get a job. And I was working when I was 13 years old and making sure I had money and that I could do certain things. And of course, the racial stuff never changed. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that with money, my stressors were different. Mm -hmm. And so I, beginning that, when I think about where I am today and the things that we're trying to do, both the training professionals and now really getting engaged with consumers is, I can't help you with all the stresses in your life. Mm -hmm. I can help you with that one. Mm -hmm. It gives you more energy and focus on the other things that are going. Yeah, I mean, well, and it's one, it's the, <clears throat> arguably the most important, um, if you will, right? I mean, it's it's financial health is is wellness, is health, is physical health, is mental health, is all of the, the things that we as humans need. And, and now I think we're tapping into a world where it's also becoming community, right? right. I mean, the capabilities of even just you and even your representation and what you stand for, right? And people from your community in Kentucky being able to see that, um, it means a lot. And I feel similarly, um, I spent part of my time growing up in a town called South Lake, Texas, okay. uh, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth <laughs> area. I think I was like just one of the few Asian kids in my school. Um, and. It's interesting to hear your story because you do kind of tell yourself certain things in your head about, oh, well, they perceive me as this because I don't have as much money as the super rich white kids or I don't have, you know, the same designer clothes or whatever. Um, and you think that's like a part of what is maybe making you be the outsider or the oddball or whatever. And then, you know, you grow up and you realize like, oh, they're probably treating me weird because I'm Asian and everyone is white <laughs> and you know and so you but it I think it's like it's such a release to be able to have those realizations mm -hmm. and I appreciate you tying that experience into financial services because they do connect um, and they do kind of push you forward in this desire to be this this strong leader of this incredible institution that's what coming up on 100 years? 100 years old. 100 years old. 27. Oh my gosh, tell us about it. We're very excited. Uh, you know, when you think about being a part of an organization that's been around that long. Yeah. And of course, there's been ups and downs. And yeah. And I came in on sort of one of the downs that we were going through, but it has a rich history. And if you think about, we've been training and providing applied knowledge for that long to mm -hmm individuals who are going out helping individuals and families and businesses. And now, as we look at sort of refreshing mm -hmm. the college mm -hmm. and thinking about how do we modernize this belief that there's applied knowledge for advisors and how do we benefit society? So now you're saying, we're gonna modernize that. Our belief is you gotta connect the advisor and the consumer. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. And that's probably the biggest, you know, people ask me, what's the biggest change? Well. Dr. Huebner said it's just advisors, and I oh my God. lived that life for a long time. Yeah. But it's like, no, 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 it's really advisors and consumers. And if you don't get the interconnectivity between the two of them, you're never going to be successful. And what we're finding is that, you know, one, every consumer is not going to have an advisor, mm -hmm. but they still should get good financial knowledge. Yeah. And so if I could help them along the way to make just a few smarter decisions mm -hmm. or to know what to look for when they want an advisor mm -hmm. or to know, you know what, on this particular situation, I need somebody mm -hmm. to talk to. Just imagine how that is going to help them along in their life. And so this modernization of a hundred years of doing this is really now connecting the two. Uh, and I think it's, it's also focused on, it's really not just money. Yeah. Uh. Okay, I think because so much of advisors I talk to is all transactional. 
Okay. I know. Or let's how do I how do I do the asset collection and then manage yes. your portfolio? Yes. But I tell you, when you really stop and look at it, at the end of the day, it's not the financial transaction. Mm -hmm. We got to do them right. Okay. Yes. But why? Why are you doing what you do? Why are you living the way you want to? What are you trying to leave? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to provide for your family, your community? Those are the whys. And mm -hmm. there's not dollar set. No. And so it makes it hard for them to like quantify in their brains. You know, why should I do that if there's no dollar sign attached to it? And it's like, how many times in history and in our world do we have to see where a sole yeah. focus on the dollar sign or profitability or whatever, like of that transaction has led to downfalls, like has led to bad things happening, has led to, and that's sometimes like the, it sounds, you know, scary, but it's the truth. Like that's the mindset in my head that I use sometimes because if we, you know, don't, learn from history, right. you know, of take 2008 in the financial crisis. I mean, I'm just now teaching a, a class. I teach a class at Parsons about financial management. So I'm teaching like design students about um, finance for the first time. And they're just just now learning about mortgages. They're just now learning about these things. And, um, you know, it's eye opening for them to see how corporate greed or how, you know, a, a lack of oversight can can spiral into affecting millions and millions of Americans lives in a global recession. Um, but anyways, I digress on that <laughs> to, um, <laughs> I can keep, doing good. I can keep going. Um, I know I had my lecture last night, but, um, I want to backtrack a little sure. and before we get into all the new initiatives and modernizing and, and actually making, you know, human connectivity, such a vital piece of the pie for advisors and financial services providers. I want to give the listeners like a little TLDR on what the American College of Financial Services is and does in case they do not know. Yeah. So let's start with we are a nonprofit. Okay. Accredited. So if you think of Princeton, Harvard, mm -hmm. Penn, we're accredited just like they are Ooh. in terms of, I always love to tell people. Yeah, that's a good one. Accredited institution. You know Princeton? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just too. Like, most too. people don't even understand what a credit means. <laughs> no. like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes. Them? Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So I always like to tell people that so they can put it in proper context. That's amazing. It's a nonprofit accredited institution for higher education. Mm -hmm. But here's the difference that when you think of many other colleges or traditional college universities, we focus on applied knowledge. A lot of college universities focus on theory. Mm -hmm. So when you say applied knowledge. I've got to make sure that when I teach you, okay, how to advise someone about retirement, mm -hmm. I better know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. This ain't about, here's the theory of retirement. No. Here's the laws of retirement. Here's where you are. This is what we're trying to get you to. And then we're going to work on a plan going mm -hmm. forward. And here's how to actually do it. That's right. And if I don't do that right, you're not going to work with me anymore. Mm -hmm. So when we think of applied, I call it actionable. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. take and we give some of the most sophisticated financial information and knowledge mm -hmm. and make it actionable for an advisor to work with individuals, families, businesses, and their clients. What the evolution has come is just imagine doing that almost a hundred years. Well, why would you only give it to advisors? Mm -hmm. Right. Who are then going to do what? Give it to consumers. Mm -hmm. Well, just in case you don't have an advisor, why wouldn't we take that information and transition it to where you could understand it mm -hmm. and start giving it to consumers? But it is really just a nonprofit higher ed education applied school that says, I gotta make sure you have the skills mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the knowledge for you to go do this. There's another piece of this that's really, really important that actually talks about your lecture. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We also focus on ethics. Now, just imagine almost 100 years ago, our founder said, yeah, I can teach you all of the technical stuff. I can teach you all that great stuff. Yes. But if you're not ethically, none of it's going to matter. Okay, good. I'm so, on the right track then with my lectures. Yes, you are. Because I've been so, doing that too. <laughs> so we're saying, yeah. even today, with all the applied knowledge we provide, we still require and focus on the ethical focus that advisors should have when they work with their clients. Mm -hmm. So you put those two together, then we say if all this done right, we're benefiting society. Mm -hmm. Gosh, and I love that take because 
you know, I, when I'm teaching at my, my class, um, and, you know, Parsons is such a cool institution, the new school, you know, it is so centered around, you know, they want us as professors to um, make sure that we are establishing our, you know, our opinions and our, um, and our you know, biases and, and sharing our perspective on how things should go. And, and it's all ethical, right? It's, it's building sustainably. It's profitability, but sustainably at no right. at all at all costs right? right and 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 nothing less than that um and i think you know actually putting that into you know the the minds of of advisors i mean i guess and which ends up in the consumer's hands and then now you're opening up to consumers so what does that start to look like for you guys yeah so <clears throat> first let's I, I and as i talk about ethics i i really do want to say that the vast vast majority of advisors and I know some people think they're not, but I'm answering. <laughs> no, I'm there's like a huge new wave of advisors yeah. now that are like focused on niches, on communities, on like, and wanting to actually learn and realizing that at the end of the day, the approach of how do you use your craft to actually, to not like, oh, there's a problem with society. I must, I have to like band aid and right. fix it. What about actually using like your craft, your solution, your product, whatever you're providing to actually inject good into the world. That's exactly right. So I, I always want to say that when I talk about ethics and the importance of it, mm -hmm. I do want people to, because sometimes I think we think of Madoff and we think, yeah, there's a bunch of Madoffs out there. <laughs> Actually, there's not a lot of bunch of Madoffs. There are Madoffs out there. Yeah. The majority of people really are saying, I want you to trust me and I want to do right by you. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's important. When we think of this, so this, a part of, again, this evolution for advisors. So, there's applied knowledge, mm -hmm. there's ethics, there's trust, because there is no trust, none of this is gonna work. And then mm -hmm. there's this belief that when we look to the future, all of us are now trying to specialize. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? Because uh, I, I give a perfect example. Uh, I give my hat off to CFP and the fact that Many people say that the CFP designation is like the designation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And we are a provider of that. And we're very proud of that and very excited about our relationship and partnership with it. But within CFP, we did an analysis and only 17% of the content is related to retirement. 17%. What's the rest yeah, of it? <laughs> It, it's comprehensive financial planning. Yeah. But it's all the other stuff. Yeah, interesting. And so part of our evolution is to believe that there are people who really want to specialize in, and some research has shown that when you specialize, you actually make more. Mm. So we're saying, how do you take and expand the 70% and do more on retirement? Mm -hmm. How do you expand and do more on philanthropy? Mm -hmm. how, because people think about the estate plan, my legacy, what I want to leave. How do you do more on special needs and disabilities? Mm -hmm. Because George's father had Alzheimer's. And when I did my estate plan, we spent more time on making sure my father was going to be okay mm -hmm. if I died first. Yeah. So now all of these things, but I needed someone very unique that knew that. And mm -hmm. so our belief is, yes, get a CFP, get a CHFC, get a COU, build on what I call the foundation of financial planning. Mm -hmm. But it is going to be more and more important that you're able to find people who specialize because you say, well, you know what? I, I'm not, I have to worry about specialty. I don't have to worry about philanthropy. I'm just worried about retirement. Mm -hmm. I want a retirement specialist. Yeah. I don't want someone who's just good at numbers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so this evolution has, it's still the core of applying, but now we're saying we probably ought to specialize. And, and part of that also connects with now the consumer side of this. It's not just how do we help individual consumers, it's how do we help their communities because we really agree to mm -hmm. We've got a lot of work in the black community. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you that as successful as I've been, I do so much in my community because I can't go home and talk about my success and I ain't doing nothing at all. Oh, I mean. It just, it, it doesn't play that well. You know. So, no. so trying to pull all these yeah. things together is sort of important for us. As well. Yeah, gosh, no, and I love that. And so, when you think about you know implementing more specialists, um, I guess is that finding like the right teachers, the right educators, like, and how does that extend into the ed the education for 
the consumer? Like, are you interested in getting more specialists to teach consumers specifically retirement or more advisors or like, what's the difference, I guess, between the education of that happens with the advisor and the one that happens with the consumer? One of the things about um, being accredited, but also being focused on applied is, mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking for a, a educated practitioner. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't, because we're not talking about theory and applied. So it's great if I could go find um, an individual who has professional designations, but he's also working in the business, taking care of clients. Mm -hmm. So okay. if I'm going to do philanthropy, I'm going to go get an advisor that works on estate plans, or I'm going to get an advisor that helps foundations, or an advisor that helps set up trust. Mm -hmm. And that's who I want to teach at the college. Got it. So they're going to have the requisite academic credentials. Mm -hmm. But they're a practitioner because, again, it's got to be actionable. So I got to give you the right information for you to go out as I'm teaching you. Now, just imagine that. So let's say we go out and find someone who's focused on retirement. Uh, and then, so they say, here's all the things you got to do for retirement, depending on where you are and mm -hmm. where you start. Well, what if I then took that and says, hmm, for a consumer, what's the four things you need to do to get started? Mm -hmm. Or what's the five things? Yeah. So you're just taking the smaller versions of that, putting it out and say, for consumers, this is what you should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. And then your advisor actually helps you implement that. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, it's just like, it's a more like holistic approach to actually. Like, that's the perfect word. Yeah. It is holistic. Yeah. And it's hitting everyone. It's hitting the advisor and the consumer and creating that like cycle of education for both of them. I mean, I love the idea of, and I'm like, I feel like, should I apply to be a professor at the yes, American College? Should. Because I'm like, because I should have two teaching jobs. Um, no, because I, I feel this way about as a, it, it is challenging as a, you know, a new professor that also is actively working. Um, it, it can be hard, but when I think about my time in college, the best teachers I had were, yeah, I was a journalism major, and I remember just being so thrilled that one of our professors, um, she was the AP West Texas correspondent. So she was on call, like if she had to leave class because she had to go chase a story that had to happen for her, but she would take us places. She would like assign us news stories. We were doing very active learning, and I learned more in that one That's class. Applied knowledge. Oh, applied knowledge, there you go. That's what you yes. is applied knowledge. Yes. Because I, I really want you to be able to get something out of this mm -hmm. that is actually going to help you. Mm -hmm. and, and and so the and you actually you said a word about cycle. So let me talk to you about yeah. that because I think that's really great. When when we so there is there's specialization and we think that's that's a growing area. Uh, and then we one of the key areas for us is gonna be retirement. We're we're really gonna because someone's got to do it. Everybody's thinking about retirement. Yeah. And I don't know that all of us are doing that holistically the right way, but everybody's thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to like, how do we begin to do that? And mm -hmm. think about but let's think about what that is. It's called a life cycle. Mm -hmm. And the reason we say life cycle is it's my kids who just got out of college, got their first job, mm -hmm. and dad told them, make sure you put money back in your 401k, this a match. And they're like, okay, but what do I do? Mm -hmm. Where do I invest it? Mm -hmm. And and why am I even putting this back? Can I mm -hmm. save this and go, or go spend it? Yeah, I know. Why am I not using this now when but, I need money now? <laughs> but they're also saying something that's different than what mm. my wife and I said. Mm -hmm. They're saying, oh, by the way, Dan, I'm going to retire 50. <laughs> well, that's a different investment strategy than me saying I'm going to retire 65. Yeah. And so we, we believe that right now, our system of retirement mm -hmm. discussions is so focused on the bookends of 55, 60, 65. Mm -hmm. I just got to get you there. And then we'll look at some distribution strategy once we get mm -hmm. there. And we're saying that. We're saying this life cycle mm -hmm. starts with, I just got out of college at my first job. And so it's not just, why am I putting money back? Let's talk about why you're putting it back. Mm -hmm. And now when we talk about that, I'm saying, oh, by the way, what's your lifestyle today? Yeah. What you expect your lifestyle to be tomorrow mm -hmm. because that's going to influence those decisions that you make about how we invest your money mm -hmm. and then the third component of this is behavior yes because well what did you learn about money when you were growing up 
to save because okay. I have an immigrant mother. So <laughs> you have a different perspective. Most people didn't have money to save. Yeah. So they never learned that. And, and so I tell people like, what did you learn from your, your father and your mother about finance, mm -hmm. even though you wouldn't get a job when you were 13? Here's what my dad said. I said, dad, can you explain it to me? He said, ain't none of your damn business. Get you a job, figure it out on your own. Yeah. Okay, that yeah. was my plan. Yeah. And my father said, a dollar made is a dollar earned. Guess what? You don't invest it. Mm -hmm. So we never thought about investments. Oh yeah. You go find your savings account and you put it back for a rainy day. That's it. That's it. That was what we learned. Mm -hmm. Now, for my kids, that's not what they learned. Mm. Because I already understood it. So I'm talking to them about, okay, you got your first job? Mm -hmm. Here's how you invest in your money. Yeah. This is where you're putting it. You're taking what percentage here? You put this percentage there so that you can get rent. That's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. So if you are getting ready to buy someone behavior, you better figure that out because mm -hmm. that will determine the decisions and suggestions they make. And so yeah. we're asking people and telling advisors, you gotta understand there's this behavioral things about how people look and understand money. Yeah. And it influences the decisions I make related to my retirement, related to how I'm gonna invest my money, mm -hmm. related to how I'm gonna make purchases. All of that comes back. We don't, most people don't get that learning. No. They just get, how much money yet? Yeah. Here's what we're gonna do with it. Yes. Back yeah. to the trade up. Yeah. And I'm saying, no, no, no. At the American College, we firmly believe that if we don't think of the life cycle from the time you mm -hmm. start to where you hope to finish and the lifestyle, how do you live today and where do you wanna, how do you wanna mm -hmm. live tomorrow? And all of the behavioral things that you brought to the table mm -hmm. when we first had our meeting, mm -hmm. you know, and how we're either gonna have to incorporate them into decision making or help you change behavior. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I love that you're involving behavioral finance because it is such an important piece of it and uh, uh, something that I hold near and dear to myself um, as someone who has literally used, it's what makes me, uh, something that, one of the pieces that makes me so excited about financial technology is is that I've experienced the change in my behavior around money. You know, I've yeah. it's gone from being this thing, and when you act like it's something that's just transactional, financial advisors is for you, then it just makes your clients feel like, the kids call it the ick, basically. The ick. Ask, your, ask your daughter about it. They call okay. it the ick, ick. these days, okay. which right. just means that it makes them kind of feel like they don't want to deal with it. Like they don't, it's like, ick, gross. I don't not really want to, in, spend my time and energy on this because it doesn't feel like it's serving me. That's like kind of what the ick is. And um, the Gen Zers can tell me if I'm wrong. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, anyways, um, and that's what, you know, behavioral finance does. It, is, it, it allows an advisor to understand that, hey, I have to account for the messiness of the human experience of my client or whoever I'm serving. And being able to tailor my services to that incredibly personalized experience is only going to make my client happier and is only going to mean that I get more. Like, and then I get to have more opportunities and they get to have more opportunities. And then it is beneficial for everyone involved. Um, I, but I do struggle. I know when I go on, you know, stages or, and I speak to this, you know, about this, this, um, behavioral financing, human connectivity, every now and then I still get the advisor in the audience. It's like, um, that's so nice for you, but my clients want me to make them more money or something or like, but my clients don't really want to hear about my beliefs or my, you know, values, or they don't want to hear about that stuff. And I'm just like, I don't know who your clients are, but have you ever maybe tried to challenge that notion? Like maybe they just don't even know how to interact with you in terms of opening up the capabilities of, hey, like I have these behaviors that make me, that make money give me the ick. I want to, I want to change that. But like, it's that communication, if you know, I think is what I'm getting at is like being more comfortable with that. You know, it's interesting that you say that because a couple of things, one is, um, Yes, there are clients. Is it's all about the money? Mm -hmm. It happens. And you as an advisor only ask who's at the kind of client I want. Mm -hmm. It's good. I mean, let's let's be real. Here. The end. I, I can tell you that that's not yeah. a client I want. Yeah. Because if all I'm there is to make money for you, what is your value system? Yeah. What are you going to do with it? It's good. So mm -hmm. part of I believe an advisor's responsibility is okay. All right, you've you've convinced me. All you want me to do is make money for you. 
Why? What are you going to do with it? Because in that conversation, you actually may hear, well, I'm going to make a million dollars and then I'm going to go start a community center. Mm -hmm. Well, wait just a minute. Now, that's a different discussion. And they may be all about the money, but it may be for cause. And your job is to figure out what that cause is. Is to figure mm-hmm. out the why. Yes. And, I like and the you know what? If if you walk in and you have no relationship other than that transaction, mm-hmm. then I'd actually question whether that's a client. That's a great response. Okay, I'm going to take that. Okay. The next time I get a, a question in the audience from someone, but I need to be transactional, I'm just going to tell them what George Nichols said. You can tell them. <laughs> I really believe, I mean, yeah. part of this, again, I got, but you're right. I have people, I have friends that, again, their their view of life is, how do I make the next dollar? Mm-hmm. You know, but you want to them, I don't hang around them much either. Yeah, I don't really. Because yeah. if that's all life is to you, Okay, that ain't what life is to me. And mm-hmm. it ain't what life is to the majority of my community. Mm-hmm. Every one of us are sitting there every day saying, why am I working? I'm working for my family. Mm-hmm. I'm working to buy a house. Or I'm working to do... Well, that's the first answer to why we're discussing the transaction mm-hmm. is because of the why that I'm doing something. Mm-hmm. And anyone who says the only why I have is to make another dollar, again, I just say, well, maybe that's not the client that I need because... But, you know, we really do need a reason why we're doing what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, the majority of the people have a reason. Mm-hmm. Your job as an advisor is to find it. Because right. I guarantee you that if you find their why mm-hmm. and you help them achieve that, they are going to love you. And forever. Client forever. forever. Yeah. Client and forever. Honestly, for life. I When I look at my advisors today, and I have a couple of them that I work with, I would say, I don't think about how much money they made me. Mm-hmm. I do think about how much they've been able to make me that allowed me to do more scholarships at mm-hmm. the college and university I am for first year nurses mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's what I think about. Right. Or how have they helped you put more money into your community's hands, into that into is, the black community's hands, into exactly right. into black women's hands, into helping actually create cycles of generational wealth for black women, for black people in general. Like it's to have those to have those actual, you know, opportunities and capabilities and, and it makes me think about how I'm always telling um, you know, I'm always thinking to myself when I as a storyteller, you know, s- stories are really meant to um, help people feel something. You know, people always remember yes. how you make yes. them feel. They don't remember what you say all the time. Um, and that's the important part. And that happens even in transactions. I also think it's a generational shift. You know, it's, it's I think, to be able, like the, the younger generation is already thinking this way, yes, right? Gen Zers, you just, I mean, your daughter, just you just told me is like, I want to retire at 50. Right? Yeah, I'm cool. like, I don't blame her. Um, I, I don't think that's happening for me, but you know, it could, I could, I could work on it. Um, but I, there is that shift, that mindset shift of I'm not, and, and it came with COVID, right? You know, mm-hmm. the world has been designed to make us just, it's like work and try to make ends meet until you die. And it's, and, and we, and we want to get out of that mindset shift. And there's, and I think there's a questioning around why do we work so hard and what is the point of this? Um, and I, I think it's, you know, tying back to, well, if I can find a sense of purpose with my community, then this makes it all worth it. I know it's why I do what I do and why I work so hard and why, and it, I can't imagine doing it any right. other way, but I feel very lucky. So I know we're closing out here, but on time, but I want to ask about any, it is called humans of FinTech. So if there's any technology advancements or things that you're thinking about in terms of how to integrate more technology tools or things into, um, or even concepts into the American college as you are entering this next era, I'd love to hear a little bit about it. It's it's not so specific that I know exactly what technology is, but uh, first of all, my philosophy is technology is just a tool. Yes. But, I mean, let's be really clear. It's mm-hmm. just a tool. And so yes. many people think it's the edge. It's not. It's a tool. <laughs> so true. And but so our view is as we go forward, recognizing the 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 evolution and all the great things are happening technology, we want to figure out who should be partners. Mm-hmm. But say, I'm good at applied knowledge. I'm not good at technology. I'm not a technology company. I'm not a fintech firm. Yeah. So how can we partner with with firms that have figured out the technology tool that's going to make the applied financial knowledge better mm-hmm. and applied better 
in turn to the client. So that's the first thing that we think. Then there's this whole AI thing that we, we're going to have to figure out. <laughs> he brought it up, not me. I'm, 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 <laughs> I mean, GPT, thank you. Everybody's trying to figure it out, okay? <laughs> so I think, you know, for us, we're going to have to stop and think about what it does, one, to apply knowledge because I yeah. go ask the right question and I'm going to give out a layout. And there's a lot of advisors who believe that, you know what, I'm going to be replaced. Oh, they always well, think this. We get back to life cycle, lifestyle, and behavior. I don't believe you're going to be replaced. No. I believe you can leverage that AI yourself to serve them better. But it's still the human component that ultimately is going to make mm -hmm. a difference. And I, I know I had friends that when Robo Advisors first came out, and they were like, oh, I'm just going to go to a Robo Advisor. And so they go to a Robo Advisor, and then they call me and they say, You listen to what the report said? <laughs> Uh, what do you think? And I said, like, Why don't you ask the wrong <laughs> well, It's telling know. you everything to yeah. do. Like, no, no, George, you know, tell me what you think. You think it makes sense? And I'm like, well, why don't you ask your advisor? Well, oh I told you had to go. I kicked him to the side. Oh, my God. I can't come to the curb and they don't wonder. I can't even... I'm, oh, I can't even with the with the robo advisor narrative, and I I've been working even at my time at Investment News reporting there. I was like working on on making sure that narrative died because there ex your, to your example's perfect. There's there's nothing to replace human connectivity. The pandemic has shown us that entirely. I would like for I'd like to completely remove this ideology that we can that that social media or social or you know or digital connectivity or even digital tools. Um, you know, in financial services, even fintech, right, is a replacement for human connection. It's literally not. It's something that can be helpful if you are, you know, removed. But at the end of the day, like, you've got to put your boots on and you got to go show up in real life. Exactly right. And as humans, we are communal creatures and there's a loneliness epidemic happening in this world that only gets greater and greater. And it's because of these phones. Um, so these are the these are a tool. They are not the solution, clearly, because they can also do a lot of bad. So it's really about understanding how the technology is actually used for good and as an extension of you as a human. And that's it. But like, you know, I get a lot of advisors that are like, that's so cool. You're good at social media. I'm not that great at social media, guys. But they're like. They think I'm young. I'm good at social media or whatever. It's easy for you. And I'm like, it is not easy for me. I don't I if I could live my life without social media, <laughs> I would. But I do it for my job and I do it for the good that I can do with it. And if I have this platform, I'm going to do what I can to use it as education and tools and and encouragement. But anyway, so well, I, I believe yeah, what you're doing is you're not doing social media. Thank you. You're a platform. Ah, yes. To give knowledge and information to people. Exactly. That's what it is. And, and there again, he's like, oh, no, no, it's the social media. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not. That's not the value proposition. The value no. proposition is what you deliver in words and help people mm -hmm. hear and make decisions better and bring people in that give other perspectives. That is the power. That's the value proposition. Exactly. Social media. Silicon Valley, I thought, was one of the most interesting things. Our ability to do digital financial transitions is allowed them to pull down a couple hundred million dollars quickly mm -hmm. from the bank. Mm -hmm. But how did that happen? Someone said something to someone. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody focused on the medium of which they did it. Yeah, I know. The fact that I called Nicole and said, I said, well, I'm pulling my money out. And Nicole said, well, I better pull my money out. I mean, that is how it happened. And sure, there was a medium of, of social media that did that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it was an individual that started spreading the word. And that still gets us back to the human component mm -hmm. of what it is that we do every single day. Mm -hmm. So well said. So well said. George, I will ask you my final question. Okay. I'm like, I could go on on that point um, because it is so good, but you ended it so strong. Um, now, if we need to be the change we wish to see, what changes do you wish to see in financial services and how do you embody it? I, I wish that financial advisors, I, I want them to be incentivized and we have to pay them for what they do. I wish they were more concerned with what the consumers want and mm -hmm. need as opposed to what they're supposed to sell or what they sell and make money. Also well said. Um, a good kicker, as uh, editors yeah. like to, to tell me. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I love that sentiment. And I think that, you know, this has just been a great 
um, discussion around s- kind of centering human connection, helping advisors and, and any, any financial services provider that does listen to this and, and professional that um, it does boil down to actually creating some sort of connectivity with the consumer on the other side. You know, we can look at all these numbers, we can look at profitability, we can look at all the data we want, but, and you can be as technical as possible. But, you know, as you said earlier, if you don't have this ability to actually be personal and connect with others, then, and, and also think for yourself, frankly, right. then all of it's for naught. Like, then it doesn't matter how technical you can be, because honestly, that's what the robo-advisor is capable of. You know, my father, uh, my father quit school in the sixth grade because uh, he had to work each for a big family. And, but the one thing he always told me was fall money. And I wish everybody would realize that the money comes from the client. Oh, my gosh. I was taught follow the money from the professor I was telling you about. Yeah, right. I'm like, on. follow the money. Oh my gosh, on that note, there you go. George, just George, yes. thank you so yes. much for joining me. And thank you, the Oprah of <laughs> All right, put that on the, the highlight reel. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. To hear our next story from another diverse leader, be sure to tune in next week. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our show and give it a five-star rating as it helps our message reach more people who want to find belonging too. Thanks for tuning in.